All right, so I want to do a quick overview of Thursday because I know it's a lot of people weren't here Thursday and it was a, a it kind of fits into the, to the, today's message. Um, so Thursday we went through the book of Jonah and we went in and saw a different perspective of it. So Jonah, we always focus on uh, how Jonah got swallowed by the fish and how God saved Jonah and Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. But what about the fact that God saved Jonah for Nineveh? You know, we've sometimes failed to, to, to see the, the big picture of the people of Nineveh. Well, when we get through the whole book of, of Jonah and at the end, you know, Jonah uh, uh, goes and he, he talks to him and he says seven words where God told him, go preach to the people of Nineveh. And he goes and says seven words. He goes, um, um, 40 days and you'll be overthrown. And he turns around and walks out. And it's like, really, that's all you had to say? And God had you wanted you to preach to the people and you come in with seven words and I showed y'all how it talks about the city is so large and vast. Um, and time frame wise, the city was uh, built over about 800 to 1,000 years at this point in time. Because uh, it goes all the way back to um, uh, uh, Noah's grandson, Asher, is the one that, that built the city. Anyways, so when you get to Jonah, it's, it's, it's years and years, hundreds of years later. And the city is vast, and it's it's uh, guesstimated. It said it's three days' journey to walk through the city, so it's probably bigger than Houston. And we looked at how how long would it take you to walk through the city of Houston on foot? And I mean, I, I haven't ever done it, but I'm thinking probably maybe a couple days if you, you know, stopped and ate and stuff like that in between. But um, on foot, Houston's a big city, so Nineveh was bigger than Houston if you think about three days' journey. Well, Jonah doesn't go into the center of the city. He goes a day's journey. He didn't go the full day and a half to get to the center. And so can you imagine if we went on top of, one of us went on top of like the ship channel and said, 40 days, you'll be overthrown. How far do you think that message is going to get here in Houston? Yet God took those seven words that he, that he said and it went across the whole city of Nineveh fast and everybody repented and stopped sinning what they were doing, rent their clothes, put on sackcloth, sat in ashes, everybody fasted, even the animals and, and everything was, was, was changed. And instead of Jonah being happy about that, he's upset. And he's like, oh, how dare they repent and follow God? You know, and that's what his attitude was. And so then he goes out of town and he, he uh, uh, builds a little shed for himself and it's not enough, so God overnight has this, uh, it's called a gourd, but like a bush, a tree, come up out of ground overnight, put a shadow over him for the day, the next day. So he gives Jonah a day of rest, basically. And then that next night, God creates a worm, which this is so cool. He creates a worm. I think this is where the movie The Worms came from, where the worms come underground and all that. So he creates a worm that eats this tree in one night. And then Jonah is like, you might as well just take my life, God. Just take my life. I can't believe you took this gourd from me. And God, God tells him at the end of the book of Jonah, are you serious? You're going to want to die over the gourd, but yet you don't care about the 120,000 Ninevite people and all the cattle and everything else that you just brought the word to and saved? You have compassion over the gourd, but you don't have compassion over the people? But you got to look at Jonah being an Israelite. Everybody outside of being an Israelite to the Israelite people, they were enemies. And so Jonah looked at the Ninevites as an enemy. And so he's like, I, I don't care if you save my enemy, they're enemies. But to God, all people are his creation. And we don't see that a lot of times. We think of uh, outside our little clique or group, anybody outside of it is an enemy. And we don't think that, no. All men are created in God's image. And anybody that turns from their wicked ways and follows God is a child of God. And, and so the whole message at the very end, uh, God was saying, are you okay with God loving your enemies? And that's hard to swallow sometimes, right? So today is a little bit tied into with that. But the title of today is, What's in Your Closet? So we kind of went through <laughs> in Sunday school, even it kind of hit on the nail where we're like, what's in your closet? You know, what, what, what are you trying to hide and stuff? So 
whenever a God, I was, I got this sermon because I was, um, God put me in remembrance. How many people watch Friends? I know I've asked this before. I haven't watched the episode in a while, but uh, Friends episode comes up. So God showed me where um, Monica, she has this OCD problem with being clean and everything has to be in its place. And she uh, uh, marries one of the friends, and so they kick one of the girls out, and he moves in. So he thinks he's going to do a big favor to her, and he's going to clean the apartment, right? So he empties all the cabinets, everything out of the cabinets. He's going to clean even the corners of the cabinets, like dust everything. He moves all the furniture, cleans everything. And one of the guys comes in and says, or her, her brother comes in, like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm cleaning everything. And she's going to be so happy. He's like, no, she's not. Like, how are you going to get everything back where it was? It might be clean to your liking, but is it going to be clean to her liking? And some of y'all know where I'm coming. You know how, how this is. It's like, and then they goes to put everything back and they go to put their feet up on the, on the, the, the table and his feet don't make it. And they're like, oh, no, it's not where it was, you know, and they, they start freaking out because they think that it was where it was, but it wasn't. So Monica comes in and she's like, what did y'all do? And it's like, you, if you looked at the picture in picture, you can't even tell, but she can tell because it's not where it was. But at the end of the hallway, she's got this closet and nobody knows what's in that closet. And it's locked. It's always locked. Always has been, always will be. So they finally find a way to get in this closet. And what happens when they open that closet? Junk just starts pouring out of this closet. And it's, it's like, okay, really? You're the OCD neat freak where everything has to be exactly where it's at. Just clean, just right. Don't touch this. Put a coaster under your glass so it doesn't have a ring spot. Like super crazy about everything. But yet you have a closet full of junk to where it's so piled up and shoved in there. You, you got to throw that last item in there and close the door real fast because it's so jam packed with stuff. But how many of us are like that? with things, different things, not, not with cleaning and not with that OCD thing that I'm talking about there, but, but with a closet in general, a closet of secrets, a closet of, of, of deep kept stuff that you don't want anybody to know about, whether it's sin that's in your life, whether it's the past of your life, your childhood maybe, you don't want nobody to know your true childhood, or you don't want anybody to know uh, uh, past relationships that you were in or you know about you don't want nobody to know how you were on your last job and so you have all these just things in a closet and you have it locked away so we're going to be in a we're going to kind of jump around quite a bit but uh exodus chapter two is where we started this morning um, in sunday school and god showed me this perfect place to start so exodus chapter two and verse 12 is where we're going to start so moses uh, just got picked up as a baby out of the, uh, the Nile River. And Pharaoh's daughter uh, gets the mother of Moses to raise him. And so uh, Moses now is, is an adult. And uh, chapter 2, verse 12 says, And he looked this way and that way. So he's looking around, both, both sides, like, who's, who's, who's going to see this? Who's around? And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So he saw this Egyptian beaten on a Hebrew. And Moses knew that he was a Hebrew by, by, uh, um, by blood, by, by, how do you say that? By birth. There you go. Thank you. He was, an, he was a Hebrew by birth. So he sees a fellow brother of his being beat up by the Egyptians. And he's like, no, I'm not going to let this happen. So he goes, he looks around, and he kills the Egyptian, and then he tries to hide him in the sand. Here's his closet. He's trying to hide, him, hide, hide his sin in the closet. Verse 13, And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews uh, were struggling together, and he said to him that was doing wrong, Why are you, why are you beating your, uh, your fellow? And the uh, he, other Hebrew uh, who made, who said to Moses, who made you a prince or and a judge over us? Intend you to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Uh-oh. Secrets out of the closet already. Just the second day. And so the point of this is 
sometimes our secrets that we hide in our closets will come out when we don't know that they'll come out or we don't we don't see that they'll come out but they'll come out so it's better to let them out the right way so over in Genesis you don't have to turn there y'all can write some of these down if y'all want Genesis chapter 3 I'm gonna read uh, verses 8 through 10 and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they already ate the fruit. Now they know right from wrong. They realize they're naked. They get a couple fig leaves, try to make some clothes out of it, and they hide. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to them, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You think you're going to hide your secrets from God? You think you're going to hide your closet of, of stuff from God? We're not going to hide anything from God. He's, he knows everything. He knows all things. He's always going to know all things. He sees everything. All right, go over to Acts chapter 5. But a certain man, man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. So to give a little backstory real fast, I know we've all heard this story. All the, uh, the people in this this um, like commune, this, this, this particular uh, area, uh, they got together and said, okay, yeah, we agree. Let's, we're going to sell everything and we're going to give it all to the apostles and we're going to live in a particular area and share everything. And so here Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, they sold their possession. Verse 2, and kept part of the price, his wife also being uh, privier knowing of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it still not your own in your own power? Why have you con uh, conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and died. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Again, do you think you're going to hide your secrets from God? So the whole thing with this is he could have just said, hey, here's part of it and I'm going to keep part of it. But he didn't do that. He lied. And while well, I, I was talking to Kim last night, I said, you know, what I see here is God, God wanted these people to be pure, to be one accord. And if you have a couple people that lie about things in the group of people that he's trying to keep pure to, 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 to build together, then there wasn't going to be purity there. There, was, there wasn't going to be one accord. And so the fact that they came and they lied about things, God just dropped them dead right then and there. So later on right there is next part. His wife came in and didn't know that he already died. They already buried him. And, and they asked her the same question. So uh, how much did y'all sell the, the land for? Oh, well, just, just the amount that he gave you. And she fell down and she died too. So God knows the secrets. God knows what's going on. And, and don't think that you're going to hide things from God. All right, turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. We're going to go through 10, 11, and 12. Just some highlighted scriptures and, and hit and miss and, and talk about them. So Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 9. He that walks uprightly walks surely or securely, but he that perverts his ways shall be known. So he that does wrong in private, the truth will come out. It shall be known. But he that walks upright or known, like everything's open, the closet door is open, like your, your, your stuff is out there to where, hey, this is, this is what kind of junk is in my closet and I could use some help with this stuff and, and is known, that person walks upright because what do you have to hide? You don't have anything hiding in your closet. Your closet's open. You might have a bunch of junk still falling out of your closet, but your closet door is open. Everybody knows, or at least the, your core group that you want to know, knows what's in your closet. Jump over to chapter 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright 
shall guide them. The Hebrew word for integrity means blameless. So the blameless of the upright shall guide them. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. So when you operate out of integrity or blameless, and this doesn't mean you're sin free. This doesn't mean that you are. This just means that, like, like I said, you're you're open. You're you're um, you're transparent. That shall guide you to where you don't have you don't have to worry about about the secrets. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Uh, what came to mind here is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot went and 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 gave Jesus up for 30 pieces of silver. I think it was 30. And it ate him up so bad that his perverseness destroyed him. He turned around and after they had Christ, he, he went and said, no, 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 what I did was wrong. Here's your money back. And they said, well, it's, that, that's on you. I don't, we, don't want, we don't want that back. And what did he do? He ran and he hung himself. It's that, that wickedness, whenever we hide secrets, whenever we hide that stuff in that closet and, and keep it locked up, it eats you up. It eats away at you, and it'll destroy you. Jump over to 12, verse 17. Proverbs 12, 17. He that speaks truth shows forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Jump down to verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. You know, when we keep secrets, God knows the secrets, and God doesn't like all the secrets. God likes us to be transparent. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 28. For, I'm sorry, 27. 27, 17. This is going to be a little turning point for us. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. When you're open with that closet, when you take the hinges off of that closet door, and you're open with your, your friends, with your, with your people amongst us here, you can build off each other. You can sharpen each other. But when you keep secrets and keep it all stowed away, it's just going to eat you up. And sometimes people have a hard time with this. I know a lot of people have a hard time opening up closets or letting anything out of that closet. They want to they want to keep that closet so full packed to where they just want to either get something out of it or put something in it and slam that door right back and not barely have it cracked open. They don't want anybody to know their business, their past, their their any anything. But it, 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 it hurts you. It's not really going to... It could hurt others around you too because of how you are, because of the whatever turmoil that keeps you in. But it, but it can hurt you more than anything. So I've recently been asked this. Why do you treat so-and-so like, like that? And the manner of the, the conversation was with more grace and more mercy and more compassion. Why do you treat that person with more grace than us? Why do you treat that person with more compassion than us? Well, because this person's been through this or this person has this. And so I, I know what that person's been through. And so I have compassion for that person. I have grace with that person. I have, you know, more mercy for that person because what that person's gone through. And I, I see that person's trying because of Iron sharpens iron because that friend is open with their, 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 their stuff that's in their closet. I'm not going to say secrets because it's not secrets. But they're open and they share that stuff and they're asking for help. They're seeking help and they're seeking to be better and they're seek, seeking to get rid of the junk that's in that closet. And so I have compassion on that person. Well, I've been through the same thing. Well, I didn't know that. How do I know that you've been through the same thing? You didn't share with me that you've been through the same thing. And then just saying, I've been through the same thing, and then closing that door right back and locking the door, the deadbolt again, I still have no information on how you've been through the same thing. 
I don't know how to show you compassion, the same grace, same mercy. I know how to show you compassion, grace, and mercy in general. But when you know a person and you know what's in that closet, you can be more personal with that person. You can have more grace and more compassion, more mercy, because you know what's in the closet. But when the closet's closed and you have no idea what's behind the bars and the locks and the, the deadbolts and the, the, the seraphim with the flaming swords, some people have it locked up, guarded that much. Now, ain't nobody going to get in that closet. Then we don't know how to show you that same compassion and grace and mercy because we don't know you. We only know what you've given us. We only know the little bit of what's up front. And so you can't expect a person to be treated the same way as another person when that other person is open with their life, with, with needing help, with, needing, with, with seeking out your, the friends to, to, to help sharpen iron, to, to help feed off each other. You can't expect that same kind of relationship when you have all the secrets locked up in your closet and you don't want anybody to know your secrets and no, you don't want anybody to help you with those. And again, those are going to eat you up and they're going to they're going to cause issues like what I'm talking about right now. Turn over to first Peter. I'm sorry, uh, James, chapter five. It's like the same page. First Peter, James, chapter five. If you're closet is full of stuff that you don't want anybody to know about seek God seek God's guidance on your closet seek God's help on your closet and hopefully eventually you'll be able to share with somebody and get some of that stuff out in the open James chapter 5 verse 16 confess your faults one to another and pray one for another See, if I don't know what to pray about or pray for, I'm just praying generic prayers, which are still good prayers that we still pray over everybody. We still pray, you know, blessings, prosperity, uh, you know, uh, uh, healing. We still pray for everybody. But if I know a specific about you and I know exactly where to hone in, isn't that so much more effective to be able to hone in on something specific? And to be able to, to then not only hone in on it on prayer, but on conversation. And on I can seek scripture out specifically for what you're going through and try to help you with what you're going through. That you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It accomplishes much. Turn over to John chapter 15. And I know with your closets being locked up, with stuff being stored in them, it's um, it's all it's different with everybody. Everybody's different, and so your personality, your history, your past, whatever it may be, you might not be able to just open that closet wide open and, and just share all your business. And I, I everybody's different because. I'm more to where I could probably share more than my, you know, Kim might be able to share. She might hold her closet a little bit tighter or, you know, not saying anything negative about that. I'm just saying everybody's different. So you have to seek God's help on how to help yourself or how he can help you by guiding you on, on getting that closet door open and broken free and letting some of that junk out of there. And you might not be able to get all of it out of there. You might still be pulling some stuff, but maybe you can just get to where you can open it a little bit further and grab this little stuff. Maybe organize it. Maybe you can organize that closet full of, of sin and, and past history and, and junk and stuff. I know that doesn't make any sense, but still. Maybe you can get to where you can work on that closet. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you, you got to work on working on it because it's going to help you in the long run. John chapter 15, starting at verse 12. This is Jesus talking. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Hereafter I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. So Jesus didn't have a closet of secrets. 
Jesus didn't have a, a lock on a closet of, 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 of problems or issues. And I know, okay, yeah, you're talking about Jesus guy, really? But he didn't have anything hidden. He, and he made it known that he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I am more likely to lay down, well, I'm, I'm likely to lay down my life for any of y'all in here, but you would be more likely to lay down your life for a close friend than an acquaintance friend. Does that make sense? You would jump in and really go out of your way for a close friend that has their closet open, that you know their, 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 their issues and everything else they're going through, than someone that you really don't know nothing about and they're just kind of an acquaintance friend. But that's what he's talking about, about love each other. Love each other to the point to where you can open that closet door and share your stuff with each other and get it out and, and get it open. And the freedom that comes with that, like, oh, finally someone else knows about this and I don't have to carry this burden because them burdens are heavy. Like the tension, like just thinking about it right now. And I, I, every time I do that and I think about the Jesus's yoke and he tells us, carry my yoke and carry and and then take my burden, how easy it is and light. The weight is lifted off my shoulders and I'm not even really carrying anything that I'm thinking of at the time. But just the thought of the freedom that he gives us, oh, your shoulders just drop. It just feels good. The tension goes away. But can you imagine the stuff that's in your closet that you've been holding on to and letting, being able to let that stuff go, the weight of it on you to be able to say, oh, finally, I have someone to confide in, a friend to, to share this with to get through this day-to-day -day struggle with. Hey, look to your left, look to your right. We're here for each other. This is what this journey is all about, to get through this, to get through the triathlon. Not to win it. It's not about who's going to win the race. It's about who's going to finish the race. And our goal together as a family is for all of us to finish together, to finish this race. To do that, let us sharpen each other's iron. Let us sharpen each other. Let us build each other up. Let us be here for each other. And not just for us inside this room, but for our friends and fellows outside these walls. We've got to build each other up and love each other. And that's His greatest commandment for us, right? Is to love each other. Father, Lord, I thank You for this, this message this morning. Kind of short and sweet, but Father, Lord, it was heavy. And Lord, I just ask for your Holy Spirit guidance on, uh, on everybody this morning, Father, and, and just to, to help to guide them to who they can talk to and how they can talk to and how they can open that closet and how they can let a little bit of that stuff out at a time and, and just get that weight off of them because it's a heavy burden for us to carry all of these, these past troubles or these, these, these dark secrets that we've got, Father. And Lord... Um, Give uh, wisdom and knowledge and your tongue to the, the one on the other end. The one that's hearing and accepting uh, the, the information from the one that's finally opening that closet. Give us wisdom and guide us to be wise stewards of that information, Father. Let us not be a, a, a wildfire tongue and a gossip with it. And I know a lot of times... That's why people don't want to open that closet up is because they're afraid that the second I say this, everybody's going to know about it. And that is not the point at all of, of our, our closets being open. It's about being able to, to share with each other, to build relationships, and to be able to get those burdens off of our shoulders, Father. And Lord, help us uh, to be wise with that and help us give us a, a discernment on, on what to do with the information given, Father. And Lord, I just ask that that you just comfort everybody and, and give everybody that little bit extra freedom today, Father, Lord, and, and just lift that, that weight off of uh, everybody's backs and shoulders, Father, and, and Lord, just lift everybody up this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.